your relationship with your microbiome is a very critical component to understanding your health outcomes and your resilience that an individual tends to have. But given that your microbiome has such a massive influence on your health outcomes, it actually becomes really exciting to think that you can change your microbiome at any given point in your life. You're not stuck with it. It's not like your genes, you know, your genes, you're born with certain genetic capabilities and certain genetic tendencies. Now you can affect which genes are on and off, which is great through the environment, but nonetheless, you have those genes and you can't change the genetic profile of your system. The microbiome is a pure ecosystem. And like any other ecosystem, depending on the forces at play, you can absolutely adjust that ecosystem one way or the other, right? In a beneficial or negative manner. Hello, hello. I'm your host for today, Dr. Carrie Jones, and I am so honored to have on my friend, Kieran Krishnan, a famous research microbiologist that you may be familiar with if you know anything about microbiome labs or the product Megaspore. Well, I have Kieran on to talk today about all your microbiomes. Turns out you have more than just the microbiome in your GI tract, but you've probably heard of the microbiome in your GI tract if you're having gas or bloating, constipation, struggling with hormones, trying to lose weight, fertility. We're going to talk about all of it. In fact, did you know more than 50% of your body are microbes? Yes, more than 50% of your body are microbes. That means a lot of the symptoms you're having may have everything to do with your microbiome and not just the microbiome in your gut. He's going to tell us all the latest research that there is out there on the microbiome, which is a lot in the last decade. We've just been flooded with it. So we have a lot to cover. If you feel you have issues with your GI tract or your skin or your sinuses or your mouth or even your vagina, this microbiome episode is for you. Karan Krishnan, I am beyond excited to have you to the Root Cause Medicine podcast because you are one of my absolute favorites. I've learned pretty much everything I need to know about the microbiome from you and continue to do so. Today, I am excited to have you on to really pick your brain, go through the research on the microbiome and really the microbiome and hormones. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Carrie. It is a pleasure to be here with you. I always enjoy any chance I get to talk to you. So thank you so much. Well, for those who don't know, over the years, because he is the king of microbiome, we lectured a lot at the same conferences and often followed each other because they would start with microbiome and move into hormones. And I was like, man, I really like this guy. This guy is cr well funny and incredibly intelligent and just the coolest person. So to have you on today is just honestly a dream. So the Root Cause Medicine listeners, buckle up. He's going to blow your mind with all the things that we're going to talk about. <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited about it. And it's so relevant to hormones. It's so counterintuitive in many ways that these microbes would have anything to do with your endocrine system. But but it's going to be fun to dig into this and, and illuminate for people the, the role in place. Absolutely. And for those who don't know who you are, you've quite a history. So why don't you give us a little background into how you got into this? So then we'll jump into questions. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm trained as a research microbiologist. That was my world. And academic research was my world for, the, for a little while. And what I realized that there's a massive issue in the world of academic research that's called a translational gap. That translational gap is the translation of all of the amazing research that goes on in academia to things that actually affect humans, right? So there's a massive gap because in academia, there's a lot of research happening for the sake of research. The research professionals there, their job is to continue to find things to study. So they get deeper and deeper and deeper into a subject and their whole world is about gaining grants to for the next study and so on, right? Rarely is there a focus to take what they're doing and translate that to things that actually make an impact on people. So that is thereby the translational gap. So one thing I realized early as I was in the world of academic research is that what I was doing there is actually never going to impact anyone unless there's a way of bridging this gap. So then I left academic research with the idea of bridging that gap and finding a way to do that through a company. You know, I speak research, I speak academic research in the science, but then I also have an intuition and an understanding of the clinical side of things and, and what consumers and practitioners are going through. So my world became, you know, translating the, the immense amount of research happening, especially in the world of the microbiome, into practical, usable, actionable information, and then also perhaps developing innovations 
utilizing that information, right? So I did that actually through before Microbiome Labs, even with a, with a couple other companies that I had founded. But then Microbiome Labs, which is became kind of the preeminent microbiome gut health company in our space, that was really the my keystone for driving this bridging of translational gap. So now I've since left Microbiome Labs. I still speak for them and educate and so on. And but now I'm uh, onto other problems that one needs to solve. And so I'm trying to make myself useful elsewhere. That uh, useful elsewhere. Yes, we, <laughs> we are, we're definitely going to talk about that. But I want to go back to the microbiome part, the microbiome labs part, because you're not kidding. I, in our field, and I think in for a lot of listeners through a lot of social media, the concept of taking what the microbiome researchers have found and applying that to the practical, tactical, everyday person, you absolutely, you uh, as a company really shown with that and helped people understand, wow, so what I'm eating, how I'm feeling, whether or not I'm having a bowel movement, if I parasites, worms, whatever really are affecting not just my intestinal symptoms, but really my whole body. And then what the heck do I do with that? Because whereas before I feel, I mean, I'm a naturopathic doctor, so I knew to quote unquote, address the gut, treat the gut. But for a lot of even integrative functional medicine, it, it was very antibiotic focused. If you had H. pylori, you were given the triple treatment. If you had, you know, a worm, you were given an anti-helminthic, right? An antibiotic to get rid of the worms. And maybe probiotics thrown in here and there. And you really took that information and turned it on its head. So I want to just start with the basics for those who don't know what the microbiome is. And then we'll go from there. So explain what is the microbiome. Yeah. So the microbiome is uh, really defined as the totality of organisms and all of its genetic elements. And that's a very key component to understanding the role of the microbiome in your everyday life. Um, so all of these microorganisms, which includes bacteria, viruses, fungi, even things like amoebas and protozoas that can exist in some people, those organisms, and then all of the genes that they carry and how it relates to the host and the host function. So when we look at the microbiome, normally we're looking at kind of the totality of microbial species especially in many different areas of your body. Often when you're looking at a specific geography in the body, like for example, the small bowel, and we're trying to reference the microbes in the small bowel, people will often use the word microbiota in that region, right? So people will hear microbiome and microbiota kind of used interchangeably. And sometimes it might seem confusing as to what one means versus the other, but that's what it means. So microbiome is the totality of microbes and their genetic elements, microbiota, specific ecosystem to a given region in the body. And it used to be thought that you were born with your, you, in the intestines, you were born with your microbiome and it is what it is. There's no way to influence it, affect it. And talk about that. Yeah. You know, that's the beauty of the microbiome, right? So I'm sure we'll get into it during this conversation, how it impacts health both in a positive and negative way, right? So your relationship with your microbiome is a very critical component to understanding your health outcomes and, and your resilience that, that an individual tends to have. But, but given that your microbiome has such a massive influence on your health outcomes, it actually becomes really exciting to think that you can change your microbiome at any given point in your life. You're not stuck with it. It's not like your genes, you know, your genes, you're born with certain genetic capabilities and certain genetic tendencies. Now you can affect which genes are on and off, which is great through the environment, but nonetheless, you have those genes and you can't change the genetic profile of your system. The microbiome is a pure ecosystem. And like any other ecosystem, depending on the forces at play, you can absolutely adjust that ecosystem one way or the other, right? In a beneficial or a negative manner. And one of the things I love about the microbiome is it starts to answer a lot of the questions that many of us have been perplexed by with regards to the human body, right? So the human body has lots of unique functionalities, but one of the things that, that we all understand is that everyone is different in some way or the other, right? But when you look at our genes, we're like 99.9% .9 similar. Most people are maybe 0.1% different in their genes, right? And that 0.1% does not answer for why 
one person can take a drug and have a different response than another. One person can eat a particular diet and have a completely different outcome than another, right? One person is incredibly stressed out and, and anxious. One person's totally calm. Uh, you know, one person gets acne, the other person doesn't, you know, like people within the same environment, within the same ecosystem, within the same kind of lifestyles can have different outcomes. And, and that is not explained by the 0.1% that most people are different in their genetics. It is, however, explained very well and clearly through the massive differences that we tend to have in our microbiomes. You and I, Carrie, could be 50% different in our microbiomes at the species level, given that we're both humans, I think. And if you look at even the animal kingdom, which is super interesting, you know, our closest genetic relatives are the chimpanzees, right? We came from a common ancestors. We're about a 1% different genetically from chimpanzees. And that 1% difference in our genes marks a lot of the physical differences that we see. But our microbiomes are vastly different than chimpanzees. As it turns out, our microbiomes are far more similar to that of baboons that have a more similar lifestyle and evolutionary adaptation because baboons became more omnivores. They came down from the trees. They roam and travel a lot more. They're a little bit more nomadic than chimpanzees that tend to stay in one area, eat a lot more vegetation, stay in the trees a lot, right? So geography, behavior, ecosystems all have affected the microbiomes of different animals, including humans. And that's what dictates our outcomes more than almost anything else. So it's funny. We, we, like we think of our body, we have a body, right? Our autonomous body. But when you, when I hear you describe the microbiome a lot, I often think of inside me and especially just related to the intestinal microbiome. It's like a whole separate city. It's like this whole other, you know, working system that obviously great affects my greater being, my greater body from the inside out and the outside in, but it's this whole other modifiable influential city that's happening creating good things, maybe neurotransmitters, vitamin creation, et cetera, but also could be contributing to bad things, symptom side effects, syndromes, conditions, risks for the future. And that's what I really want to get into because you and I were saying this off camera, you know, I've been reading so much lately in the literature around the microbiome and the microbiome and the development of Parkinson, the microbiome and the development of Alzheimer's, the microbiome and even something like ringing in the ears. So let's let's really get into that. What does the microbiome influence through the rest of the body? And we'll sort of move our focus into hormones because that's such a common question. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's two ideas that people really have to grapple with to truly understand this, right? So number one, if we look at our functionality as a, as a human, we conduct thousands of chemical reactions in our body every single minute of every single day, right? We're, we're constantly translating uh, genes into proteins, and then the proteins go to work, and the, and the proteins facilitate all these enzymatic reactions. So th lots of things are happening in our system we don't have the genes to account for all of these things, right? So the Human Genome Project was kicked off in the late 80s and early 90s with the idea that we would be able to identify a gene for every dysfunction that occurs in, in the human, right? There's going to be a heart disease gene, an Alzheimer's gene, a Parkinson's gene. And once we understand the genes, we'll understand what proteins they make. And based on that, we can intervene in the disease state by intervening on the on the epigenetics of the disease. Right. So the early estimates before they sequenced the entire human genome was that humans should have somewhere around 250,000 genes at least. Right. That was kind of the target number that people were looking at as they're starting to sequence the genome. They completed the sequencing. And what we found was that we have about 22,000 functional genes. Right. About a tenth of what they estimated as the base level. Right. So then that created a lot of questions because not only a does that sound like very few genes to actually account for all the things that we're capable of doing. B, when you compare it to the rest of the animal kingdom, it actually pales in comparison. So an earthworm, for example, has 30 to 32,000 functional genes. Right. So an earthworm that's burrowing in the dirt and spending its whole life as a simple organism is far more sophisticated than we are from a genetic perspective, right? So then it like blows your mind and goes, okay, wait, so how do we do what we do? Why are we at the top of the evolutionary ladder, top of the food chain? Well, as it turns out, then the micro human microbiome project got kicked off after that in part because of this question. And then what was discovered is that in us, we, can, we contain about two and a half million microbial genes, 
So that's where all of this capability comes from. It's from the microbial genes. So wrapping our heads around that concept, number one, is really important because what it allows us to understand is that a huge majority of our functionality is afforded to us by the microbes that exist in our system, right? And so whether or not we have certain capabilities or we lack those capabilities are going to be heavily dictated by the microbes that are present, right? So that's one concept to wrap, wrap our heads around. The second part of it is that the function of our, each of our organs are dependent on certain microbial ecosystems, right? So the small intestine, the moment you start to change the type of microbes that are native to the small intestine, the small intestine no longer functions the way it's supposed to. You start getting things like SIBO, right? Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then all of these associated symptoms and complications that come along with it. Why did all that happen? Well, that's because the ecosystem in the small intestine changed. Right. Same thing with the large bowel, same thing with the skin. Right. If, if the ecosystem on the skin changes, you can develop atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, acne, leaky skin, all these other complications just because the ecosystem, the microbes on the skin change. So when the microbes in a given region shift from their native state, then you're going to change the, the function of that native system, right? So, so that's a really important thing to think about too. And one last concept that people should wrap their head around is that your microbiome can, can be on one end of the spectrum, the most supportive, protective, nurturing thing for your system, for your body, for your organs, your brain, your heart, everything. Or on the other end of the spectrum, it is arguably the most toxic thing that is part of your system, right? So everyone's microbiome is somewhere on that spectrum whether it's really toxic to their system or it's really protective and provides ultimate resilience, that remains to be seen based on their symptoms and the disease states and so on that they have, right? So as we go through and we talk about conditions and we talk about disease states, keep in mind that the prevalence and the severity of these disease states is, is based on what microbes are present in given regions, what microbes are absent in given regions, and what is the relationship like to, for between us and our microbiome? Is it a microbiome that's severely toxic to us, or is it a microbiome that's very supportive? Right? Those concepts are ones that people have to kind of wrap their heads around first. Which are huge concepts because it's not really taught about in general medicine. You don't hear about it in your primary care visit. You know, you surely don't get it in your yearly annual. So this is really important that this information gets out there and we talk about this. How would somebody, I know people listening are like, that's me, I'm the toxic one. Like my, I'm listening to this because my microbiome does not like me. Wherever the ecosystem happens to be in my body, what are some key factors that you see or have researched really causing, creating, pushing you to lean towards a toxic microbiome? Yeah, and, and unfortunately, to answer that question, the answer is a little bit alarming. And the, and the answer is, if you were born in the Western world, you're already in a place that's driving you towards dysfunction and, and a high toxic microbiome, right? So let's let's think about just some of the basic things we're all exposed to on a, on a regular basis. Number one, 30 to 35% of all the births are C-section births, right? Now, in some cases, you have to have a C-section birth for the life of the baby and the mom, totally understandable, but there are many elected C-section births, right? So that alone it sets uh, the the baby off on a uh, on a journey that's going to be more disruptive to their microbiome because they're not getting the full inoculum moving through the vaginal canal like they should. Number two, companies have done a great job of convincing moms that formula is even better than breast milk because formula is fortified with DHA and this, that, and the other. You know given that breast milk is the only mammalian food perfected by evolution over millions of years, and it's one of the most important components of seeding the, the baby's microbiome, and that so many women, you know, are, are, are brainwashed to think that formula is just as good, if not better, then there's no urgency, there's no motivation to breastfeed as long as you should, right? Mm -hmm. So again, right off the bat there, we're, we're starting off on the left foot. On top of that, most kids before the age of four have two to three rounds of antibiotics already, right? And a lot of times it's for viral issues, right? Things that the antibiotics won't actually help for. Even the CDC estimates that 50% of antibiotic prescriptions are unnecessary, 
right? They're being given for colds and flus. A lot of it is some as the parents pressuring some of these urgent care docs, right? I, and I've I worked with this urgent care clinic group as I was trying to develop some immune support, supportive products for them. And what they were saying is that they have, you know, they're a business, right? Unfortunately, medicine is a, is a significant business here, but they're a business and they, have, they count on patients coming in. And when patients start to come in during cold and flu season, they're sick, they can't afford to miss work, they want to get better soon, they can't afford for their kids to miss school because then they have to stay home, right? All these complications that occur in our world. And then they go to the doctor, the doctor knows that they're dealing with a viral issue, but the patient puts pressure on the doctor to write them a script for something because they feel like if they take something, they're going to get better soon, right? And if that doctor doesn't prescribe, next time they're sick, they won't come back to that facility. They'll go to a different urgent care center, right? And that's the economics of what we see. And so then the doctor goes, all right, I guess I'm just going to write them a Z pack or something for three, four days. In the doctor's mind, because they don't understand this yet, they're thinking, eh, it does no harm. It's antibiotic. You know, they, people take them all the time without the understanding that this actually completely disrupts the ecosystem and actually makes it harder for their immune system to fight the virus, right? So, so then we're taking too many antibiotics early on. On top of that, our food and water supply are, are laced with pesticides and herbicides. We also know from the research that these pesticides and herbicides selectively kill good bacteria over time, right? So it's an, it's an evolutionary pressure to deform the microbiome to allow opportunistic organisms to prevail. I'll give you an example. We did a study with King's College in London where we exposed a pristine three-year-old's microbiome. So this was a really diverse pristine microbiome. This is a vaginal born baby who had breastfed for a year, almost a year and a half, never had a vaccination actually, never had an antibiotic. So it was a pristine microbiome from some fjord in, in Northern Europe, right? I mean, you're, you're not gonna find those in, in, the, in North America. And so we got this microbiome and we exposed it to Cheerios level of Roundup with feeding the microbiome over time. In three weeks of exposure of the level of Roundup that's allowed in Cheerios, three weeks of exposure, the microbiome started to shift from what looks like a really healthy microbiome to one that is on the road to IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. Right? Three weeks. It was mind boggling that the shift occurs so fast. What the microbiome was producing completely changed. One example, before treatment, the uh, before exposure, the microbiome is producing high levels of short chain fatty acids, right? Really important for your health, butyrate, propionate, acetate, and so on. Then in three weeks later, the levels of short chain fatty acid reduced by somewhere around 70%. And then it started producing branch chain fatty acids, which are actually toxic in many ways, right? So this is a perfect example of a microbiome that's highly supportive. And then through environmental and lifestyle factors has now converted into not only not being supportive, but being toxic because it's producing toxic compounds. The same thing, the microbiome is producing, uh, breaking down proteins really well, releasing amino acids so that the system can absorb amino acids. Now the microbiome was converting those proteins into ammonia gas predominantly, right? In three weeks. So this again is an example of a microbiome that's supportive for the body, making bioavailable amino acids to the body for building and rebuilding muscles and all that good stuff. Shifting three weeks later to one that's converting these healthy proteins into something toxic like ammonia, right? So that right there illustrates it for, for us. So from the moment we're born, we're born into this place that works against our microbiome. I, I always say that we are a beautiful microbial construct. We're made up of thousands of microbial species that have to work together for to perpetuate the health of the whole. And we take this microbial construct and we put it in an antimicrobial world. Right? Everything around us is antimicrobial. So being born into Western civilization works against our microbiome. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. And especially if you're on social media at all, you will definitely see the posts or videos from maybe more conventionally minded folks who feel, you know, the levels of glyphosate and Cheerios are fine. They're, they're appropriate for human consumption. They've passed the FDA clearance, like everything is all fine there. But yet the amount of chronic disease that we have in our world, and especially in the United States, is astounding. You know, the amount of autoimmune we have that's developing is astounding. So this is a three-year-old that maybe by 20 would have developed 
inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's ulcerative colitis, something, or another autoimmune, a, a different, you know, type of autoimmune and, or some sort of chronic issue disease, but nobody's thinking back to like, you know what, at three years old, we started introducing, you know, Cheerios into their diet. And I don't mean to pick on Cheerios per se, but I think everyone knows what we're talking about. And as a result, here we are. And so sure, in a short study by the company or the FDA of saying, no, no, it's perfectly safe. It's totally at risk. It's like, well, you, we don't usually develop chronic disease until we're older, although that age is getting younger, unfortunately. So it is hard to put together of the early childhood microbiome assaults with something that starts in your 20s, 30s, and 40s. Yeah. And, and keep in mind, so here's a very important point that people need to remember is that currently, and, and certainly historically, there's never been a need to prove that a given food or substance or compound that we're allowed to consume or is approved for consumption has any impact on the microbiome. That's not part of the testing, right? So the reason why Roundup is allowed for use in the U.S. is because it interferes with the biochemical pathway called a shikimate pathway. That's how it kills weeds, or that's how it kills pests, right? Because these lower order animals like pests use the shikimate pathway as a very important way of making something called aromatic amino acids. And so this compound interferes with that biochemical process, which ends up killing the pests. And, and then the way they tested it on humans was that, oh, the human cell doesn't use the shikimate pathway, right? We have other pathways to create aromatic amino acids. And so you incubate human cells with it. It doesn't kill the human cells. But most of the microbes in your system use the shikimate pathway, right? And it's never been tested on that. And same with almost any chemical that's released. If I came up with a new coloring or a new flavor compound next week, right? What I would have to do to prove that it's safe for human consumption is I do a 28-day feeding study and a 90-day feeding study. What that means is I take groups of mice and then I dose them at a certain level through the food or, or through IV, but it's typically through food. I dose them at a certain exposure level that we would assume the humans would get. And then I see if it kills them. And then you dissect the animals and you look at the liver and the pancreas and all the organs and see if there's any toxicity. If it doesn't kill the animal, it doesn't provide any toxicity, we assume it's safe. And that's a 28-day feeding study and a 90-day feeding study on rats, right? That doesn't tell you anything about how it impacts the microbiome. It doesn't tell you anything about eating this stuff for five years. It doesn't tell you anything about how it interferes with our ecosystem. And that, that kind of testing is still not implemented or required. So as people look at food products and all that stuff, they should not feel comfortable that it is approved by the FDA. It's on the shelf. So it's okay. It's not actually true. You need to listen to programs like this to truly understand what's affecting your ecosystem and what's not. And taking that, taking that concept then for somebody listening, thinking to themselves, well, I don't understand still how a toxic microbiome or the microbiome, like, and I'm just going to keep sticking with the microbiome in the intestines, even though we have more, um, how does that affect everything else in my body? Like, how would that affect my brain? How would that contribute to depression? Or how would that contribute to, you know, hormone dysfunction? Yeah. So there's a lecture that, I, that I've done for a few years now, and I've added to it quite a bit. And maybe you've seen me do this lecture, but it's a, it's a lecture on uh, endotoxemia, right? And it's leaky gut. And then I go through the pathology of leaky gut, what that actually means and what, it, what happens to, for the gut to become leaky, but then show through research how that one dysfunction connects all kinds of conditions, right? That we would not think are connected at all. For example, reflux disease and diabetes and colon cancer and depression, right? You normally think and go reflux and, and anxiety and colon cancer have nothing to do with each other, right? They affect different parts of the body. In fact, if you ask 90% of allopathic doctors, they'll tell you they're not related at all, right? One is upper GI, one is in your brain, one is in your large bowel, they're nothing, they're not connected at all. Well, in fact, they all have the exact same origin. They all have this exact same driver, right? And, and that is that dysfunction in the gut. 
So to, to put it simply for people, there's two ways to think about a dysfunctional gut. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, when you when the ecosystem in, the, in, in a given organ is disrupted, that means that organ no longer functions the way it's supposed to function. And this is even more true for the GI tract than almost any other part of the body. So think about the role of the, of the gastrointestinal tract, right? The role of the gastrointestinal tract in general, if we combine the small and large intestine and the stomach, is to is to bring in food nutrients, assimilate the food and nutrients, and and then allow that assimilation to provide nutrients to the rest of the body, right? And, and a lot of that starts to happen in the stomach, and then largely we absorb our nutrients in the small bowel, and then anything we can't break down or digest, like fiber, for example, moves into the large bowel where it gets fermented, and more nutrients are created from that fermentation, and then we absorb those nutrients, right? So the gut is in general, just this amazing, beautiful nutrient factory where we're directly pulling nutrients from food. And then we're also creating nutrients that aren't currently present in the food that we synthesize from the food itself, right? So that has to happen with the digestive system or our system doesn't function. It's no different than starving yourself, eat, not eating for 30 days, you're gonna get really sick. You can be eating every day. If you're not assimilating and synthesizing nutrients, you're also going into malnourishment. So fundamentally, if your microbiome is disrupted in your GI tract, starting with your stomach to small intestine to large intestine, you will absolutely disrupt that process of breaking down and assimilating nutrients and then synthesizing critical nutrients in the large bowel, right? So that in itself doesn't happen, which means all of the other organ systems in the body that count on those nutrients, whether it's the brain, the skin, the heart, the lungs, those aren't getting the nutrients they need, right? So that's the same as starving and going into malnourishment, right? So that's the fund most fundamental part of it. The second part of it is if there's a disruption in the ecosystem of the digestive tract, it's, it no longer functions like the barrier that it's supposed to function. The lining of the gut, is where a lot of judgments happen, right? The lining of the gut is where two critical things are happening when, when, you, when it gets exposed to outside things. Keep in mind that the digestive tract has the largest exposure to outside components for the body. The skin, you get exposure to things in the environment, but you're eating and drinking things constantly. Everything that goes through your nasal passages, your eyes, your ears, all drain into your throat anyway. So all of it is going through your digestive tract. So that's where A, the digestive tract has to act as a barrier. So things that shouldn't get absorbed in don't get absorbed in. Things like viruses and unwanted microbes and toxins and so on shouldn't make its way through. And then B, your immune system gets to decide what is in the environment and what it should pay attention to and what it shouldn't, right? What it should attack and what it shouldn't attack. Because one of the you know complications of the immune system is that you're constantly under assault by lots of different things, but many things your immune system is supposed to tolerate. And there are some things your immune system is supposed to attack, right? Like we don't want our immune system attacking food all the time, right? Then we're gonna cause all kinds of food sensitivities and all that. We don't want our immune system attacking ragweed or pollen. Then we get allergies, right? We don't want our immune system attacking things that it shouldn't be attacking then we get all of these immune disruptions. So that decision of what the immune system attacks and doesn't attack is also made in the lining of the gut, right? So one area to think about is the breakdown and assimilation of nutrients and the synthesis of nutrients that the body needs. The other is the barrier function of the intestinal tract, as well as where the largest immune sampling occurs as well. Now, if you have a disrupted microbiome, not only are you not breaking down and assimilating nutrients that feed the rest of the organ systems, you also end up having a leaky intestinal tract that allows the translocation or leaking through of toxins and inflammatory compounds into circulation on a regular basis, right? So it becomes the largest source of chronic low-grade inflammation in the body. On top of that, you also have a disrupted immune response because now the immune system is assaulted with lots of things leaking through. It doesn't have time and the communication with the microbiome to decide what to tolerate, what not to tolerate. So the immune system's default mechanism is to attack everything. Okay, so now you're super inflammatory, hypersensitive to everything, 
you know, restricted on the foods you can eat and so on and so forth, right? So just those two dismantling alone, not only will you not feed the organ systems the nutrients they need, but you're also feeding them inflammation and toxicity that's coming through the lining of the gut. We know that the vast majority of chronic illnesses are inflammatory conditions, right? We know that. And so then the question is, where is it, where the inflammation coming from? The biggest source of inflammation is from a dysfunctional gut. One more thing to quote on that. So there was a paper published in 2015 in the Frontiers of Immunology. It's a meta-analysis paper. That means it's a study of lots of studies on the topic to kind of drum up scientific consensus. They basically concluded that a leaky gut is the number one cause of mortality and morbidity worldwide, right? Loss of that intestinal barrier and the leaking in of toxins and that discon connection now of the immune response, that kills more people worldwide than anything else. And that's because that's the foundation of most chronic disease. And a lot of times in our medicine, when I get asked, where should I start? Where should I start? I'm not sure where to start. 99 out of 100 times, we're like, start with the gut. Start with the gut. Start with the gut. Start with the gut. And especially in the world I'm in, of hormones, when people say, oh, this person has bad PMS or their perimenopause is terrible or they're struggling with fertility. You, you know, where should I start? Should I give them this hormone? Should I give them this hormonal herb? And I'm like, I always ask, well, what's going on with the gut? What's happening there with the gut? Because I know it doesn't seem related, but as you just explained, it's very related. Yeah. And speaking of hormones, you know, we could take estrogen as an example, right? And I would say you would know this better than I would, but I think estrogen dominance is probably the most common hormone disorder. Right. So what's happening there in estrogen dominance with regards to the microbiome? Well, as it turns out, the microbiome plays a very important role in the recycling and the control of hormones in the body. Right. So estrogen ends up in the gut. And in fact, a beneficial gut microbes in, in this constellation of microbes called estrobilome uh, through an enzyme that it produces can convert the more potent forms of estrogen, like estradiol into estrone and, and estriol, right? Which are less active than estradiol. So it, it dampens the activity or the hyperactivity, if you will, of estrogen. Then the microbes can actually even metabolize it further to help get rid of it. So you don't reabsorb as much estrogen. And so we reduce the estrogen activity. We, we decrease estrogen recirculation, which then prevents estrogen dominance. Now, if you don't have those microbes, then what happens is you reabsorb more of that estradiol. And in fact, you could have dysfunctional microbes that deconjugate the estrogen that your liver is trying to conjugate so it doesn't get active and it's no longer absorbing. That, that gets dumped into the gut for, for detox. And then those dysfunctional microbes, not only are they reducing the activity of estrogen, they're actually increasing the reabsorption by removing the conjugation from it, right? So these microbes are playing this pesky role in all of this. And then not only that, if, if as I mentioned, a dysfunctional microbiome is also always going to be associated with increased chronic low-grade inflammation. Uh, and the moment you increase chronic low-grade inflammation, you actually screw up hormone signaling production of hormones, right, by the sex organs themselves. Uh, and there's a good amount of data on that. So one of the one of the ways in which we measure elevated um, inflammation from a dysfunctional microbiome is looking at LPS levels, this endotoxin lipopolysaccharide that leaks through the lining of the gut. And studies now have shown that if you have increased LPS, you have uh, a diminished functionality of hormone signaling, carrier function, utilization, bioavailability, and so on, because you also screw up the sex hormone binding globulin, right? Which is something that's made by the liver and it's really important, but elevated LPS screws up the liver's capability of making sex hormone binding globulin. So now you have this, you know, active free hormones floating around the body and causing problems. Whereas this awesome carrier neutralizes, doesn't allow the hormone to be active until it takes it to the side of action where it needs to function and it and it controls the level of active hormone in the body. But that microbiome imbalance can totally screw up that important carrier. I was even just reading a paper earlier. I was looking up the androgen receptor. I got a question about women who are facial hair, right? Facial hair, cystic acne, not necessarily PCOS, but maybe PCOS. And uh, this practitioner was like, I don't understand. I have, you know, this person is 
normal, not great levels of testosterone, but yet they seem to have all this dark facial hair that's not ethnically related. What's going on? And I, when I was looking into the androgen receptor, one of the big up regulators, promoters, agitators is inflammation. It will increase the androgen receptors production and ability to bind. And so if you have this low grade inflammation or even high grade inflammation, and then you have a little bit of testosterone float by even a little bit, the androgen receptor is mad and it's inflamed and poof, you get cystic acne or you get a dark hair or, you know, in your scalp, you've, you've got female pattern baldness. And I thought, I don't think anyone talks about this. We talk about testosterone blockers or acne medication or things to support that, but nobody's said, well, why is the androgen receptor so irritated? And low grade or high grade inflammation can be a big reason. It can, uh, absolutely. And then if you think about that same situation in a man, it actually has the opposite effect, right? So because when you have elevated inflammation in men, what you actually have is a reduction in gonadotropin function. So you have a reduction in testosterone production. And in fact, the pituitary gland in men, right, di dictate to the, uh, to the testes to make the sex hormones. And what happens is when you have elevated inflammation, it actually blocks the signals from the pituitary gland to the testes and you get a reduction in the amount of testosterone. Then you get gynecomastia in men and feminization, a physiological feminization of the man and reduced you know, fertility and all of this stuff. So that same inflammation has can have opposite effects in men and women because it's creating a, a significant imbalance in the utilization and, and the bioactivity of those hormones. But in both cases, it's the gut that's responsible for driving that, right? So when we could like go deep dive into all these things that are going on into their hormones and all that, but it, it could very well be as simple as, well, we got to fix their gut. Yeah. Even I think it was last year, speaking of men and declining hormones, but it was a menopausal talk. I don't know why this had never, ever, not ever dawned on me, but with the decline in estradiol and menopause completely shifts the microbiome more for the worse. And so I started looking into that same with men and the decline in testosterone. Generally, as men start to get older, their testosterone starts to go down. And, and it if you already have a dysfunctional microbiome and you are going through menopause or andropause, listening to this right now, and you're thinking to yourself, this is getting worse, the gut, that, that shift, that downshift in hormone is negatively affecting the gut and worsening the cycle all over again. And I was like, oh, it's so not fair. Yeah, it's it's a perpetuating cycle, right? Because, and, and we see that in stress as well. This is, this is a perfect example of a per self-perpetuating cycle in stress, right? Because we know that elevated stress creates dysbiosis in the gut. And it does so in a couple of different mechanisms. One is that there's lots of opportunistic organisms within your microbiome that have developed an evolutionary adaptation where they only express their virulence factor and their growth factors when the host is under stress, because that indicates to them that that's the right opportunity, if you will, because the host's immune system is suppressed, right? So lots of bouts of stress mean that lots of these pathogens will start expressing their virulence factor and overgrowing. It's the same as taking antibiotics, right? So it can create very significant dysbiosis. Now, that dysbiosis that it creates actually will cause you to experience more stress because those organisms prefer the host to be in a stress state. So they can actually produce neurotransmitters that increase HPA activation and your stress state. Then your increased stress state creates more of those organisms which then creates more stress states and it just keeps going on and on, right? And so you have to intervene at some point and cut that off at the gut and reshape the gut to stop this reactivating, a reactivation of the HPA axis. Um, and, and that's a really important thing because in some of these cases, and even in the cases of hormones and hormone imbalance, the individual will often say, well, I don't feel like I have anything wrong with my gut. They don't have any like primary GI issues, right? They might have some sensitivities to certain foods. They might have some bloating and things like that. But people really learn to live with a lot of digestive discomfort as if it's normal, right? Uh, if they haven't tolerated this food for the last five years, they just avoid it. And they're like, All right, you know, I'm perfectly normal I, as long as I don't eat that, right? And so often they're feeling the effects of hormone imbalance and they're feeling it in their brain or in other parts of their body. They ignore the dysfunction in the gut 
and the digestive symptoms, because that is so much more minuscule compared to the other things they're experiencing. So intuitively, they don't connect it to, right? And, and I hear this from people a lot. And when they're talking about low testosterone and the symptoms associated with that, or, or women with imbalance, especially perimenopausal imbalances, and I'm like, well, have you looked at your gut? And the first response is, well, nothing, I don't have anything wrong with my gut. You know, I'm, I'm fine. I go to the bathroom once every two days. I'm fine. <laughs> Not actually normal, but you know. so I, I think one of the things that programs like this and, you know, clinicians like yourself that, that really do an amazing service to the population is get them to refocus on where some of those root cause drivers are. And often it's in the gut. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the next, as we wrap this up, the next, like, what do I do is the next question. Like, how do you feel about GI testing, stool testing? We, a question we get a lot is just probiotics. Is it okay? Can I take a probiotic every day? Should I take a probiotic every day? And I know that some of these are big questions to unpack, but just to give people hope or point them in the right direction of, yeah, that's me. Everything you've talked about this whole episode is me. What is the next step? Yeah, absolutely. So if they if they focus on really two things with regards to the gut, you can you can make dramatic improvement, right? So the first thing, which is really kind of a category of things, is starting to reduce your exposure to things that we know are harmful to the gut, right? So starting with food, the food you eat, the more processed the food is, the more packaged it is, look at the back of the package, you'll see things like potassium sorbate and all these preservatives and antimicrobials, all of those are going to be extremely damaging to the gut. If the food comes in plastic or you're still using plastics, right, to heat up your food or store your food or drink your water out of, all of those are leaching microplastics, BPA, things like that, that we now know are really harmful to the gut, right? If your food is not from an organic source, you're going to get lots of more pesticide and herbicide and all that on it. Even organic food will have some, but at least you'll reduce it if you go towards organic. Try to grow a few things if you have the space and the capability. So let's say you love tomatoes and carrots and you, you add it to your diet most of the time, grow some. The, the tomatoes and carrots you'll grow, I, I guarantee you will be much healthier and cleaner than what you'll buy from the store, right? So just working towards cleaning up your exposure levels to things that we know are harmful. Then your personal care products are really important as well, right? We think we put something on our skin, it's just on our skin. Nope. We absorb most of the stuff that we put on our skin one way or the other. I've been working personally to clean up my personal care products one by one over the last several years. Don't let it be daunting. Don't let it be overwhelming. Pick one thing at a time and focus on it. Like I started with deodorant. Like I was, I, I had to go through like 20 different types of deodorant to find one that works for me, right? That's clean and works for me because you'll find like super clean, natural deodorant with only four ingredients, but you put it on and you absolutely stink. Like it doesn't work for your chemistry, right? So you might have to try a few different things, but clean up your deodorant, your lotions, your toothpaste, your shampoos, right? Uh, the cleaner these compounds are, the, these personal care products are, the better off your microbiome is. Um, and then another, uh, so that's, that's the exposure thing, right? So uh, reduce your exposure to things that we know kill organisms. Then the second part of it is how do you gain favorable exposure to the kinds of organisms you need to gain with, with one big goal, and that's to increase diversity in your gut microbiome, right? If you just do that, uh, if you just focus on that, you will make significant improvements in lots of other conditions that you're dealing with. So how do you do that? Well, number one is diversifying your diet, right? As much as you can. So adding in new foods into your diet on a weekly basis, you know, add in a new vegetable, a new fruit, a new meat source uh, into your diet on a weekly basis, and then maintain that throughout the end of the year, through the year, you've had, you would have added 30, 40 new foods into your diet. The more foods, the more diversity in foods, the more diverse your microbiome is going to be. Um, if you can add in an intermittent fasting regimen, intermittent fasting has been shown to increase the diversity of your microbiome, add in adequate intake of polyphenols, Polyphenols are the next wave of prebiotics. We now know that there's lots of critically important microbes in your microbiome that feed predominantly on polyphenols. And then they produce compounds that your cells and your mitochondria really need in order to function and regenerate. And you can only get that from feeding your system polyphenols. So what are polyphenols? Just Google polyphenol rich foods. You'll find it's various types of berries, cherries, things like that, right? And then increase your intake of fiber and prebiotics. 
right? So prebiotics typically come from like fibrous portion of fruits and so on. And then fiber is your general kind of non-digestible carbohydrates, right? So everything from the simplest psyllium husk to more complicated things like arabinogalactans and so on. But just Google high fiber foods, high resistant starch foods, and start feeding the large bowel bacteria. That's the predominant food that the large bowel bacteria want. So you start doing those things alone, you'll significantly improve your microbiome. A quick answer on the probiotic side. So I think most people need a probiotic on a regular basis, but what probiotic is the most important part, right? I would beware of these, what I call kitchen sink probiotics. So these are things with like 15, 20, 25 strains in them of really high doses. You want to make sure if you're using one like that, that there's some studies on that finished formula showing its positive impact on the system, right? If not, you, you're potentially putting your own microbes at risk of having competition and inadvertent inflammatory responses and so on. There are some, there's like, you know, VSL3, for example, is a probiotic that's like a hodgepodge conglomerate of like 20 strains, 800 billion CFUs, but then they have like eight or 10 published studies, right? So they show that there is benefit to people with, you know, IBS and certain types of inflammatory bowel conditions. We use spore probiotics a lot. We developed that. Spore probiotics, the thing I like about them is that they have a way of modulating your microbiome. So what they do is they read the microbial signatures and then they bring down the overgrowth or overgrowing of potentially pathogenic organisms and they increase the growth of beneficial bacteria. So they're constantly readjusting your microbiome. In that study I talked about earlier where we expose that three-year-old microbiome to Roundup and we continuously expose it to Roundup over the next six weeks, what we did in the second half of the study is as we were exposing it to Roundup, we started adding in the spores. And what we saw in three weeks later again is the spores are starting to correct the dysfunction in the microbiome, despite the continuous exposure to the Roundup, right? So that's one of the things I really love about the spores is because they're kind of your daily protectors, if you will, of your microbiome in this world where your microbiome is constantly being assaulted. There are also individual strains or formulations of probiotics that specifically help with certain conditions like psychobiotics to help with anxiety. There are probiotics that specifically help with feminine issues like vaginal bacteriosis, uh, vaginal bacteria, uh, what is it? Bacterial that, vaginosis. That thing. And so, you know, there are specific strains that help with just that. And there's specific strains that help with IBS symptoms like um, bifrolongum 35624. You can find that as a strain that helps specifically with IBS symptoms. So there are strains that'll help you with specific issues and conditions. There's spores that help you with general maintenance of your microbiome. And then there are a couple of these giant hodgepodge of probiotics. If they have studies showing improvements in certain conditions, then they, then they should be one that you could take safely. But it's really the diet, the lifestyle, the prebiotic and fiber and resistant starch consumption that's really gonna make that impact, right? And then the avoidance of things that impact your nut microbiome in a negative way. Well, this has been absolutely amazing because I am all about the practical and tactical around here on the Root Cause Medicine podcast because people listening are from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of budgets, and you know, the microbiome is a hot topic, but for a reason. And so I'm just beyond thrilled to have you on today to talk about all this. And I know, as you said in the beginning, you're kind of, you know, you've kind of pivoted into, into the world that you're in. So Tell us where people can find you because you are still a, a, a wealth of education and what you're working on next and what we can expect. Yeah, two, two really exciting things that we're working on that are going to come out before the end of this year is one is on, on the hormone space in, in very much in your world, but it's using the power of computational algorithms to really assist people and practitioners in understanding root cause of hormone dysfunction. You know better than anyone with, with having worked with Dutch for so long that it's an amazing test that gives you a lot of information, but it's really hard to connect those dots for most practitioners. It's virtually impossible for consumers that are, that are trying to understand what's happening in their life. But even for practitioners, that's why they went to your team for consults, right? To try to understand heads or tails of it. So we've been able to recreate a program really kind of uh, starting with your mind and then the mind of, of practitioners that are really good at hormone analysis 
and recreate that in a computational algorithm that can now read the test within seconds and give you really deep insight into exactly what's happening with, with the dysfunction. So driving better understanding of root cause medic medicine, right? Because uh, to me, the biggest issue with root cause medicine is the complexity of it, right? It, because it's so hard to some, sometimes figure out the root cause, it becomes easier to treat the symptoms. And that's kind of what people default towards. So if we can use computer-aided technology to understand root cause, that's what we're going to do. So that's a company called EndoAxis that's going to be launching before the end of the year, sometime in December. So if people have ever done the Dutch test or even blood test for sex hormones, they can utilize this program or their practitioners can utilize the program to really understand what's happening. And then there are products that are specific to each of the pattern dysfunctions. The second one is also super exciting. That's I'm working on leaky skin. I've done a lot of work for years on leaky gut being a big driver of chronic issues. And we know that dysbiosis in the gut drives leaky gut. Now there's some amazing studies coming out showing that leaky skin, not only is it a real thing, but it is an independent risk factor for driving chronic illness. And it starts with dysbiosis on the skin microbiome. And surprise, all the things that we expose our gut to that causes disruption in the gut microbiome we have equal number of things that disrupt the skin microbiome and we lose the barrier function on the skin. The, a lot of this data comes out of this study called the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging, which was started almost 55 years ago and still going now. They basically took individuals in their late 20s, early 30s and started following them over the next 50 years to look at how their biology changes, how their microbiome changes, and their lifestyle and behavior and how all that adds to the risks of aging related dysfunction. And what they found fascinatingly was that the best predictor of mortality and morbidity in these individuals, their, their risk for illness and risk for death was how their skin looked, right? The aging of their skin, right? Fine lines, wrinkles, dryness, redness, all the things that we look at as like age related dysfunction of the skin. Now, the knee-jerk reaction is to go, well, that makes sense because they are obviously unhealthy on the inside, which is then reflected on the outside. But it actually was not the case. The aged skin came first and the aged skin actually caused inflammation and dysfunction on the inside, right? So because you lose the barrier function of the skin. And in fact, when the skin is disrupted, you get a lot of inf inflammatory responses in the mucosa of the skin, which then translates to the rest of the body. For example, Alzheimer's now is thought to be largely driven by leaky skin and an overgrowth of a fungal species on the skin that drives lots of inflammation in the underlying layers of the skin, right? So it, it's absolutely fascinating. So to me, I'm like, holy cow, we... we we found a way to stop leaky gut. We published a number of studies on that with the spore probiotics. Now we have to work on leaky skin. And the benefit of working on leaky skin is that it also then has a cosmetic improvement because we are reducing inadvertently fine lines, wrinkles, dryness, thinness of the skin, and all those other things that go along with it. So that's a company called Civ, S-I-V, Civ Care. And we're coming out with our first biome balancing serum with some really great data on improving the microbiome of the skin and resulting conditions like acne, for example, or redness by the end of this year as well. So that'll be coming out. Well, obviously I'm very excited for both EndoAxis because I've talked to thousands of practitioners over my decade at Dutch and even more consumers who are really struggling with how to understand their hormone results. So that's amazing for EndoAxis. But selfishly, Karan, <laughs> I am super interested for vanity purposes and also to prevent chronic disease, the leaky skin aspect. So I cannot wait to hear more about that when that comes out and, and see that. So and you'll be getting some. Of I'm like, products. keep me in the loop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll be sending you a couple of the serum bottles for you to try yourself. And I think you'll be super excited about it because even people that don't have, for example, acne or redness or eczema or anything like that, one of the things that they notice within a relatively short amount of time, so we're talking about about two weeks, 10 days to two weeks, is a change in the topography of the skin. So the texture and uniformity of the skin 
And then another thing we're seeing is a change in the, in the pigmentation of the skin. So one of the factors of aging skin is this heterogeneous coloring, right? Because you've got some of your melanocytes are turning into senescent cells. So they're overproducing pigment. This is why you get dark spots and so on. And then some of them are functionally like normal. So you have your normal complexion in some areas, darkening areas in other areas you start getting more homogeneity or uniformity in the skin as well. So lots of cool stuff we're seeing with it. We're also seeing really great results in people with alopecia areata. So if you have, you know, fungal overgrowth or autoimmune-like responses that are thinning your hair, it can really be helpful for that too. So lots of exciting stuff. I mean, I think the concept of leaky skin is going to be a brand new one for a lot of people. Not surprising, but also brand new. So I will be sure to have you on in the new year to talk all about that so you can explain that as opposed to today, Leaky Gut. So thank you again for being on the Root Cause Medicine podcast. I just really appreciate it. As usual, you are the best and it's been a blast. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for doing this. I mean, I think this kind of empowering people with with understanding of how their body works and what's driving their conditions is absolutely critical for the for the health of humankind in general. So I appreciate everything that you do to educate people. So thank you for having me.